All right, so let me begin by thanking you all for uh, coming to the symposium. Uh, many of you are practitioners, many of you are people who support practitioners, and we're all extremely grateful for the important work you're doing to educate the country's youth in virtue. So, as you know, this panel session is called Teaching Antiquity with Style. Um, none of us selected that uh, title. We'll see if we can live up to it. But ultimately, what we're really looking at is history as it was understood in antiquity. So the lineup here is I'm uh, Matthew Post. I'll be talking first on Thucydides. Then we'll have Greg McBrayer on Xenophon. And then Joshua Kinlaw talking about Seneca and St. Augustine. Now, and there are going to be some leading questions that may be more in the foreground or more in the background. Um, but, of course, one of these key questions is going to be, what is history? What are its proper methods? What is its place in education? Is it an art? Is it a liberal art? Now, here we're not going to have time to discuss at any great length what a liberal art is. For now, and uh, I'll let uh, my colleagues offer their own definitions if they disagree with this, um, a liberal art is, by its very name, something that is to help you practice freedom. Um, the presupposition of that is that you're able to govern yourself. The presupposition of that is that you are virtuous, and the presupposition of that is that you may be oriented towards something that transcends you, right? So there's a lot packed into that idea of what is a liberal art, and there's a lot packed into what an art is. But again, that's not our key focus today. Um, does its study, the study of history, aspire to cultivate virtue? Right, I think that's a good question, or is it just a question of knowledge? I'm going to begin with a distinction from Aristotle's Poetics, where he discusses poetry, philosophy, and history. And in this context, he's comparing poetry and history. And he says that poetry ultimately is more philosophic than history. History simply tells you what has happened. It's just a haphazard chronology of events, whereas poetry gives you what could happen. And in order to give you what could happen, what's plausible, it has to reveal to you the truth about human beings, the truth about human community, because unless it reveals that to you, the poetic work is not actually plausible, right? And that's the big thing we always complain about in our artistic works, I don't believe it. You know, it just doesn't, it has no credibility, right? So the way that it attains that credibility is by presenting human nature accurately, or the divine accurately. Um, so that's his criticism of history. Um, but the reason why I give this as an opening frame is because I would argue that Thucydides, as well as the other thinkers, well, especially Xenophon, and we'll see what happens with Seneca and St. Augustine, but Thucydides is actually all three. He gives you a chronology, he reveals what is possible by revealing something about human nature, and there's something philosophic and contemplative in it at the same time. Um, I also want to frame this in the context of contemporary concerns. And to some extent, this is looking to some of the talks we already had, like Stanley Kurtz's talk and Bill McClay's talk. Um, <clears throat> so some concerns that confront the study of history today, and you can see what I have up there. It is visible, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, it is. Okay, good. Um, is, so I have it here as chauvinism, identity, politics, and polarization. Now, I use the word chauvinism in the place of many words one could put in there, right? Nationalism, racism, sexism. The reason I use chauvinism is because, honestly, I just find it more precise, right? It means to um, endorse something to an extreme uh, typically based on a prejudice or, in any event, has an implication of going too far. Your cause, your group identity, something like this. Um, and this is obviously a concern in the study of history because how does chauvinism relate to this? Because inherently in this idea of going to an extreme to advocate for a cause or for a group is entailed degrading others. And as a practical matter, degrading others in speech often, if not always, leads to harming them in action or in deeds. Okay? So, that, so really what it comes down to is it's a concern with injustice. Right? Now identity politics also emerges, as you know, from a concern with injustice, especially for minority groups. Right? And there's a distinction between oppressors and the oppressed. And identity politics is often going to be looking at and accusing people of chauvinism, even if that's not the word that they use. Now, as you know, between these, uh, these accusations, there is a lot of miscommunication, a lot of anger. Right? 
So the person accused of chauvinism, or let's say make it simple of racism, will say, well, you're saying that because I'm white, I'm a racist. Or that because this is the color of my skin. Well, that is racism, right? So that accusation is thrown back. And they might say that's the essential character of identity politics. The person who's dedicated to identity politics may perceive themselves as writing injustices, and they'll look at the chauvinists and say, well, you, you practice identity politics too, right? With the rise of Trump, we hear about white identity politics. So between these two um, groups firing at each other, of course, we get this problem of polarization, which is not just a problem that people talk about today. Um, it was a real problem in Thucydides' time and one of the biggest things that he wrestled with. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, some responses to these problems, and we already heard a bit about this from uh, Stanley Kurtz, is an approach which is revisionist, um, and another approach which is deconstructionist. Um, and you can see what they're doing here, the revisionist approach, right? You can see this in a simple question. Was America founded in liberty or in slavery? And I know I'm oversimplifying hugely, but I got 20 minutes, so we can save some stuff for the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> but just to lay a baseline for what we're talking about here, so the revisionist account is we were all told it was born in liberty. We looked, we saw it was false. We're going to revise it. It was actually born in slavery. And those of you that are familiar in trends in history know that this, is, this, is not, this was something that was going on a long time ago, but it's also very relevant today. Um, and again, it's with a concern to writing the injustice, because the point is that if you think America was born in liberty and if you think it's free today, then you're sweeping under the rug injustices from the past and injustices now. The very act itself is harming people by taking away attention from what's really going on. Now, one can debate whether that's true or not, but that is the claim. Um, as for the deconstructionists, this is in a way, and I think uh, as Stanley put this well, it's a much bolder approach to the problem, is to say that, well, we talk about the glory of America, and people who keep talking about the glory of America or the glory of Western civilization, as Stanley was talking about it, again, are people who sweep the injustices under, under the rug. They sweep the ugly things under the rug. And we're gonna attack this in a bolder way and say there is no such thing as Western civilization. It's, it's an invented concept. There's no such thing as America. Now, it should be obvious that in one way or another, these two things cannot coexist. You can't say America was founded in slavery and say there's no such thing as America, right? Um, however, one reason why you might see these things coinciding is because they have a common enemy, and all of us are familiar with the idea of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Um, so these are two ways of dealing with these problems, and we'll give some thought to them, but something that I want to say right off the bat, which may be controversial, it may, may not be, is that Thucydides is a revisionist and a deconstructionist, um, which might be surprising coming from the father of history. We might want to look back to Thucydides at the time that it was pure before all these things happened. There may not have been such a time, or if there was, it's Herodotus, who not represented on this panel, so too bad for him. Um, but one thing I'll say is that, uh, as I'm going to argue, he's a revisionist and a deconstructionist of a kind, right? In Thucydides' time, and he describes this quite vividly in his work, you see great battles going on between Athenians and Spartans. You see civil war. And civil war in some places reaches such a peak or such a depth, if you want to, such an adir, if you want to look at it that way, in which family members are killing each other. So if we say to ourselves, oh my God, you know, America is so polarized, I hate to tell you, we don't know the first thing about it. Read Thucydides, then you'll find out about polarization. Right? So he's addressing this problem, and in the way that he thinks through history, he is also addressing this problem. So who is this guy, Thucydides? What is his reputation? You may be familiar with it already. Right? He's the father of uh, power politics, realpolitik. He strips away the illusions about human nature. There is no such thing as justice. There is so no, no such thing as uh, nobility. And anyone who thinks so is a dupe, and if you're actually going to be able to act responsibly in the world as a leader, you need to um, disavow these things. Actually, I said uh, justice and nobility, also piety, right? The gods do not care about us. They do not interfere in our affairs. It may have social utility, but you cannot act on the basis of your religious beliefs if you're gonna act clearly. That is his reputation. We're gonna examine very briefly whether that reputation is warranted. Um, is he a historian? I think that is also a good question. Uh, as you guys may know, uh, history does come from a Greek word. Maybe you've heard, right, history. 
Um, actually, it comes from a Greek word, historia, and it's nothing to do with him or her, or stories. Uh, historia, me historia means inquiry. And the reason why we call it history from that has to do with Herodotus. And we'll, we'll come to Herodotus in a minute, but I'm pretty sure that that word doesn't appear anywhere in Thucydides' work as a noun or a verb, a participle, or anything. And it's a pretty normal Greek word, so I feel like he went out of his way to not use it. Um, so and from a, in a persnickety way, he is not a historian. But let's see what his purpose is. This may help clarify. So there's a part of the work where he just tells you straight up what his purpose is, and I'm actually going to read this aloud. So his work is intended for... Well, I'll say one thing briefly first. You could translate this and say it's about those who want the truth, about the, the past, um, thinking about in the course of human affairs that the future may resemble the past. It's not a bad way of translating it, but his literal language is a little bit more challenging and I think in a way more helpful. So he says, it's intended for however many will wish to observe what is clear of that which has come into being and that which will be, or it could mean is destined to be or likely to be, at some time again, according to the human. Such things coming alongside that which will be. Okay. So one thing I really want to emphasize here is, first of all, it's a pursuit for that which is clear. And there's this emphasis on what is according to the human. Right? So whatever it is that you are expected to learn from this, it has something to do with the human. And if there is a cycle that emerges between what has come to be and what will be, this has to do with the human. But he also says that he's offering a possession for all time. So one of these things that is said about Thucydides is unlike Plato and Aristotle that want to talk about the eternal, Thucydides is about constant change, constant chaos, violence, and war. Um, but it is still a possession for all time, and the Greek word used there is the same Greek word used for the eternal. Um, now, you don't want to translate it that way in Thucydides, but it's the same word. So, a bit of a primer here. What are the different categories of the human? Barbarians. They exercise clothed, like all barbarians. They go armed everywhere. They disregard custom and law when power permits and they are tyrannical. These are in contrast to, you know it, Greeks. They exercise naked. They go unarmed at home. They have greater respect for custom and law, even when they have the power to disregard it, and they have liberty under law. Now, the Greeks themselves are divided into two major groups for Thucydides, Spartans, and some of this I'm not going to get into. We don't have time for it, but I just want to make you aware of it. So they have a Dorian ethnos and culture. They're a land power, and this is something very important for Thucydides. Land power means something to him. Um, so they're laconic, they're reserved, they're traditional, they're slow, untrusting, deliberative, cautious, always at home, like to enjoy what they have, and they're oligarchic. That means they prefer the rule of the few. And they also like it if other people have this regime. And the rule of the few is always premised upon some claim to virtue. Uh, Brasidus in the work says, our claim for the few to rule is because we are the ones who have proven ourselves in battle, right? Sometimes people will say their right to rule is the few is because they are wealthy, but it's not really about the wealth. It's because you're the kind of virtuous person that has come to wealth and retains wealth and knows how to spend it responsibly, right? You have a, a stake in the community because you have wealth. Um, then you have the Athenians. So Ionian, ethnos, and culture, they're a sea power. And again, this is something which has a broader meaning for Thucydides. They're frank, they're innovative, they're swift, they're daring, never at home, restlessly acquisitive, and they're democratic, right? And they like to leave other regimes undisturbed. At least they did at a certain point. They changed their minds later, but they like tribute, right? That's what they want to get from others. And democratic, democratic I want to be clear what this means here in Thucydides. It does not mean the people rule. Right? It means the people who convince the people rule. Right? So things are done by a democratic vote, but it's what we would say today, the demagogues, the populists who rule. So the idea that the few or the oligarchs are the rich and the Democrats are the poor doesn't fully pan out. But the Democrats might always speak about poverty. So these are the fundamental characters. And by the way, what, what do all these groups want? They want everything. All of that. Although, ask yourself this, how much of that is Athens? 
Okay, so we have these categories, and in some sense or another, these are categories of the human. Now, the first objection that's gonna emerge at this point is, look, um, yeah, I mean, there are Athenians today. I don't think they're these folks. If any of you have seen Sparta, it's a bunch of rocks in the middle of a, a field. Um, but that is not really what Thucydides is illuminating here, right? There are different ways of understanding these as categories of the human. They can be approximations. You can look at them as, as attributes that tend to go together, right? So people who are comfortable going unarmed at home are also gonna be the kinds of people that have greater respect for custom and law, right? That makes sense. Um, you can look at them as binary dynamics. So one of the ways that when I teach Thucydides in a full semester course, we look at this and we say, can we apply this, for example, to the Cold War? Can we apply this to the Civil War? Um, I try the Crimean War, no one knows what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, so we, we hit up some of the big ones, World War II, World War I and World War II. And at some point or another, students kind of say, well, it's obvious that, say, the Soviets um, are the Spartans and Americans are the Athenians. And they like this and they find this comfortable. Um, but then you have to ask yourself, well, who is the more innovative and who is the more disruptive in terms of the society? Who is more respectful of traditional culture between Americans or Soviets? Um, this actually gets me to the bottom point, it could be heuristic. One thing I'll say is that when you have these discussions where the students use these categories to try to parse out dynamics that they see in history or even at work today, because we actually also use these to talk about contemporary politics. And when I'm teaching through cities, sometimes students will say, I don't understand why the Republican Party did this or the Democratic Party did that. And I'll say to them, why don't we talk about oligarchs and Democrats? It's a very, very interesting conversation. I won't get into it right now. But anyway, so when you look at these, uh, these dynamics, you can say, well, maybe everyone is innovative, but one is more innovative than the other. One identifies as innovative. That is their raison d'etre, right? Um, one thing I would also caution here, it doesn't have to be every attribute all the time. Um, just because you exercise clothed doesn't have to mean that you're a barbarian. Um, you probably are though, but it uh, doesn't have to mean that. Um, so yeah, it can be present to differing degrees. And Thucydides will even see that these can change. He actually talks about an affair of Poulos where the Spartans become like Athenians and the Athenians become like Spartans. But nevertheless, you're looking at what is around proximally and for the most part, and that's something that's gonna be determined by environment, history, and culture, and it's operative at multiple levels. So all of these attributes you can find to some degree or another in every society, but Thucydides' point is, but some are more predominant, right? And you have to look at the ones that are more predominant. Um, and they're operative in, in societies, they're operative in groups within the societies, they're even operative in individuals. Now these categories for him emerge from conflict. So at the period of the Trojan War, his argument is you don't really have a clear distinction between barbarians and Greeks, but there's something about the Trojan War that illuminates that distinction. And similarly in the Persian Wars, you have Athenians and Spartans, yes, the cities exist, but they are not the, the uh, polarities of the Greek world. It's through their success in the Persian Wars that they come, become the predominant powers, and that's when they start to become the peak of these things that, you're, that I've listed here, these attributes. And for him, this is part of a whole cycle of history, beginning in piracy, and piracy is not just piracy at sea. He also says there are land pirates, i.e. raiders. These lead to the construction of walls, which lead to the first stable societies. They start to build navies to protect themselves. And then you have the Trojan War, distinguishing the nature of barbarians and Greeks. Then you have colonies and the expansion of empires. Then you have the, per well, the beginnings of empires, sorry, just expansion through colonies. Then you have the Persian Wars, which leads to the distinction between Spartans and Athenians. They develop confederacies in which things are still seem to be more or less legit. But then they start to become empires where the perception is that they are actually oppressing uh, the people in their confederacy, their allies, the people that they fought the Persians to liberate, they have now come to oppress. At least that's the argument. Now I said that there is a way in which uh, Thucydides is a revisionist and a deconstructionist. So um, one thing I'll say about his revisionism, as I mentioned here, the critique of the mytho -edetic. Um So he says, I don't like the, t the introduction of stories. So he says, you know, Homer gives you this epic account of the Trojan War. He says, when I look at it, it's pretty obvious it was a pathetic conflict of not a lot of interest. Very, very small navy. And he says, and the greatest evidence that it was a pathetic conflict is it took them 10 years to get into Troy. 
If there had actually been a real battle, it would have been settled a lot quicker. So you know, there's a revisionism there, and think about what that does to your identity as a Greek person if this is someone that you go to to learn what it is to be a man or a woman or what the relationship is between the human and the gods. He's totally pulling the rug out from under that. And then one of his deconstructionist moments is he says, it's even like our name, Helene. You know, this is just some random name of some random tribe that just by complete accident, we, we started calling ourselves this. And you may be like, well, that's not that deconstructionist until he starts to say things like the barbarians are this and the Greeks are that. And then later he says, when you look at uh, some of our ancestors, we've discovered that they kind of did the same things barbarians do. Right? So you see him quietly undercutting everything. So what you see here ultimately is that it begins in barbarism, chaos and piracy, and then you get the Peloponnesian War, and what happens in the Peloponnesian War is the categories break down, right? Athenians behave like Spartans, Spartans behave like Athenians, the cities are animated by civil war, and all order starts to disappear. So it right, begins in barbarism, perhaps it ends in barbarism, and that is just the hard story of life. And by the way, you know Hobbes was inspired by Thucydides, right? I think you can see it there. And you even see this in his account of Athens, which due to time constraints, I'm actually gonna set aside. But again, it begins in these ancient times of barbarism, proceeds through a, a glory period with Thucydides, um, the emergence of tyranny with the Pisistratids, which as you already know, is a barbarian way of ruling people, um, rise of naval power, you know, the expansion of their confederacies, Pericles, where he finally says, yes, we have an empire, but it's a tyranny and then the post-Periclean age where they invade Sicily, and again, it's tyranny. And actually, if you kind of look at this carefully, you might wonder, well, wait, 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 you use the word tyranny a lot. Did the high points ever actually occur? So you can see again how there might even be something going on here between Thucydides as an ancient historian and something that our modern historians do. You might get a bit depressed at this point, but there is hope. Um, Thucydides, has a distinction between deed and speech, right? And he says, everything is broken down to deed and speech, and history, well, his, his work, let's not use the word history, his work looks at deeds and speeches, and he makes a distinction between the idea, the cause, and the prophasis, which in Greek means it's related to that which you profess, right? There's actually, they're, they're cognates, profess and prophasis. And you, people that haven't read Thucydides in Greek will say Thucydides is all about the deed, not the speech. He's all about the idea, the cause, not the prophasis. He's the first historian to really look at it scientifically and about the facts. One key problem, though, when you read it in Greek, he says the truth is in the prophasis, right? And by the way, anyone who's read him in Greek knows there's nothing controversial about what I just said. What's controversial is why does he say it? Because it doesn't sound like him. It's because there's another side to Thucydides. And this is something that we uh, rarely appreciate because we read him in selections. Actually, if you read the work lengthily and in its, uh, as a whole, there are all these tiny little hints that justice is real. You can actually find something that Socrates claims in one of his works, The Euthyphro, that no one actually disagrees about what justice is. They only disagree about who has committed it, right? That is a very interesting thing to discover in Thucydides. Uh, he actually suggests that beauty and nobility are real, and you can find them in nature as well as in human society. And he even suggests ever so subtly that there might be something which is divine and that it interferes in human affairs. But it's done with a very, very light touch. And when I teach this to students, they raise a question to me, which I find, um, which I'm very, very grateful for, is they'll say, once we, I, you know, I offer them these these strange moments in Thucydides that point in this direction, I say, what do you think of that? And for a long time, they're like, I have no idea. But when you start to get at the end of the course, they say, it's adding up. He might actually think nobility is real. He might think justice is real. The gods are, or some kind of divine power is real. Um, so they, but only at the end does this really start to hit them. And then one student once said to me, I just wish he'd say it plainly. Why can't he be clear like Plato and Aristotle? And the truth is that there's a really good reason for this, and this is the answer I gave that student. I said, right, because when you go out into the world, you'll meet the people in the white hats and the people in the black hats, and you'll have something right there blaring at you, this is justice, and something blaring at you, this is injustice. And he started to smile, and I said, exactly. The real world isn't like that. Plato and Aristotle are essential, and it is difficult to understand what virtue is, 
But by the same token, if you're going to be an adult in the world, you have to realize that those expectations to see virtue in the world are not going to be fulfilled. And when they're not fulfilled, you're going to become cynical. And as you become more cynical, you, uh, and through your idealism, you may become the kind of person who fights too hard to try and make the world the perfect place and you cause harm that way, or you become cynical and you cause harm another way. Thucydides' solution is actually to offer you a text that trains you to find those small, thin, gossamer threads of the just and the noble and of the divine as it is in real life, as it is messy, and as it is lived. And one of the reasons why he, takes, why he uh, engages in his process of revisionism and deconstructionism is because so that you can build those things back up. That once you start to see that there is such a thing as justice, once you start to see that there is such a thing as nobility and the divine, you can say, you know something? Maybe the name of the Greeks was something that just came here willy-nilly and accidentally, but there really are potentialities in human nature, and they can be distinguished as Greek and barbarian, and they can be distinguished as Athenian and Spartan. And in fact, by the time you get to the end, it's not even clear barbarian is a criticism. It's just something that you can understand, and each of them are windows into virtue. And once you understand that, you start to be able to understand what it is to be noble in a patriotic way without having to descend to chauvinism. You start to be able to kind of person who can listen to someone through identity politics and say, you know something, maybe we disagree on this, that, or the other, but you do care about justice, and it's gonna be very hard for me to figure out how to articulate bringing you over to my side. Maybe it'll never work, but because I've done the hard work of finding this, Thucydides gives you concrete advice for negotiating those things. So what he offers you is an approach to history that deals with and tackles head-on polarization with a view to educating you to be prudent so that you can be the kind of person that leads a community that will always be fractious, but that you're the kind of person that can keep it together so it can attain to excellence. So thank you very much. Xenophon, sometimes Xenophon is placed alongside Thucydides and Herodotus as one of the three greatest Greek historians from antiquity. But he's nevertheless not nearly as well known as they are. Most of my audiences have never heard of him, so this is a well-educated audience. Uh, the other, another problem, of course, is that Xenophon wasn't only an historian. Uh, he wrote other kinds of works, uh, including treatises on skills that gentlemen ought to learn, including how to deal with horses and, and dogs. Uh, he wrote dialogues. He wrote two treatises on constitutions, in fact, on Sparta and Athens. He also wrote uh, a number of books on his teacher, Socrates. Uh, so here we have an historian who has the curious distinction of having been educated by perhaps the greatest teacher of all time, Socrates. So perhaps we should pay attention to this guy, Xenophon. Yet despite, or maybe in fact because of his education, Xenophon's mode of doing history, and I would add his understanding of the purpose of history and its place among the human inquiries differs widely from that of his predecessors. Um, so I'm gonna speak to you about his chiefly about his um, historical works, of which there are three, the Hellenica, the Anabasis, and the Syropaideia. Uh, so on the one hand, Xenophon seems to follow his predecessors. He wrote a book about history that was before his lifetime, the Syropaideia, or Education of Cyrus. And he writes two contemporary histories, uh, things that he would have been familiar with, including the Hellenica, which uh, is called, simply it's, it goes by Hellenica often. Uh, some of you may have seen it as a history of my times or something like this. Uh, but Hellenica just means simply in Greek, Greek stuff which is a pretty awful title. Uh, so there's that. And then the Anabasis of Cyrus, sometimes you'll see it as the retreat of the 10,000 or the march up country. Uh, literally, it's the rise of Cyrus. It's about Cyrus the Younger. And then the third one, the education of Cyrus or the Syropaideia, which is a little easier to translate. But all the titles are kind of weird or, or they don't seem to make a lot of sense for us. So Xenophon wrote history, but he differs from Thucydides and Herodotus, as I just mentioned. They at least seem to appear to strive for historical accuracy or objectivity. My apologies to um, Matthew. The same simply cannot be said of Xenophon. He departs from history and he makes no bones about it. No one, for example, holds that this work, the Syropaideia, is meant to be an historically accurate account of Cyrus's life. By the way, how many of you did the Cyrus reading for the thing? For the, oh, good, fantastic. Uh, similarly, although to lesser degrees, the Hellenica and the Anabasis also depart from historical fact. So what is Xenophon up to? If Xenophon is indeed an historian, he's an historian of a curious kind. Perhaps if we look afresh at his historical writings, it can help us critically to evaluate what exact, exactly history is and, and what its purpose is. Um, let's see, I think I've already talked about these three books. Um, the Hellenica is typically about, is more or less about the conclusion of the Peloponnesian War. I'll return to that in just a moment. The Rise of Cyrus is about Cyrus the Younger, and the, and the, the third one is about the founder of the Persian Empire. 
Um, I'll briefly discuss the Hellenica. I'm going to cut a lot of that way back uh, because I found out that you guys are doing the education of Cyrus, and so I'm going to focus a little more time on the education of Cyrus. My argument is that Xenophon's historical works are guided by a purpose, one to which concerns for historical accuracy or objectivity are subordinated. For Xenophon, the primary purpose of his history is pedagogical. That is, Xenophon's principal concern in his writings is with the education of his audience. And in the first place, that means he's concerned, above all, with educating toward virtue. His histories must be morally salutary, and they must also contribute to the intellectual virtue of his audience. Xenophon is trying to improve us, morally and intellectually. And as people interested in classical education and virtue, I believe these are goals that we share. Now, perhaps I'll state this more controversially then. So in order to achieve these goals, of moral and intellectual improvement, history must occasionally be, I'll put it politely, embellished. Or to put it less problematically, we have to emphasize some things over others. So here is a quote from the previous mentioned book, The Anabasis of Cyrus. Uh, Xenophon, who happens to be the hero of that book, uh, he says at a certain point the following quote. And yet, it is noble or beautiful. I should pause for one moment. There's this Greek word, since Matthew did it, I feel like it's OK. There's this Greek word, kalos or kalon which can mean something's beautiful and noble. So there was this, there's this strange Greek word that means simultaneously the same things. This will be important, actually, in just a moment when I get into something. So in any event, it's, uh, it's more noble, more just, more pious, and more pleasant to recall the good things than the bad. It should be a little obvious how that contributes to our moral education, but let me briefly speak about how it also contributes to our intellectual, this idea of suppressing things. Uh, my friend Steve uh, in middle school, he had two girlfriends, uh, Betsy Lou and Betsy Sue. I'm, I'm going to give you an example that's kind of in the spirit of Xenophon. This is how Xenophon says things. Uh, so Betsy Lou, uh, she was uh, captain of the track team. She was captain of the chess team. She volunteered at the homeless shelter. She uh, sort of saved puppies and, and sort of put them with homes. Uh, she was beautiful. She was smart. She was a leader. Uh, and so that was the, his first girlfriend. His other girlfriend, Betsy Sue, she was very pretty. There we go. Xenophon doesn't say nasty things. He leaves it for you to draw out the conclusions for yourself. I'll give you another example. This is actually an example from the Anabasis. When Xenophon travels to various cities on this military campaign, he'll say it was large, inhabited, and prosperous. And then he'll go to another city and say it was large and inhabited. And so then you can draw the inference that it was not prosperous. So he, he doesn't say these nasty things. You have to kind of figure them out for yourself. So it's a kind of intellectual training, I think. Um, in the education of Cyrus, which you guys all just read a little passage from, at one point, Xenophon counts for you the number of troops in Cyrus's army. And in the next chapter, someone asks Cyrus how many troops he has, and Cyrus misstates the number of troops. Well, A, you have to count for yourself to see that that happens. And then B, you have to ask yourself, why is he giving a false account of the number of troops in his army? Uh, and by the way, most translations correct that to the right number, so you would completely miss that, there's, that, that Cyrus is actually misleading his audience in some way. So I'll speak a little bit about the Hellenica, and then I'll try and turn to um, the education of Cyrus. Uh, you already heard Matthew's talk on the Peloponnesian War, so I'll just pick up here a little bit. Xenophon's work that most closely fits with what we understand history to be would be his work called the Hellenica, as I mentioned above, Greek stuff, yes? But it's not simply a book about Greek stuff, language, dining habits, family, uh, demographics, these kinds of things. It's about war, specifically the Greek war that led to the end of Greek civilization, the Peloponnesian War. He picks up, in fact, where um, Thucydides seems to have stopped. It seems as though Xenophon's Hellenic is simply a continuation of Thucydides' Peloponnesian War. It seems also, therefore, what are we to infer from the title Greek stuff? To me, it seems that for the most part, history has been the study of what great men have done. And that means more or less war. So Xenophon seems to be conceding that the, the primary thing we focus on in history is war. Whether or not he agrees is a different story. What would have led Xenophon to publish a book on war that seems simply to be a continuation of Thucydides' work? There are myriad reasons, but let me suggest one among the many. To the extent that one becomes interested in ancient Greece, one's gaze is drawn to its two principal cities, Athens and Sparta. Perhaps Xenophon would have understood this, and therefore would have wanted to attract the attention of certain persons drawn to the martial histories of these ancient cities. Given this primary interest in the political history of Greece, I suspect that Xenophon suspected 
that for certain types of individuals, the Hellenic would be the first book to which they would turn of his. So I think Xenophon wrote his history of the Greek Peloponnesian War in part to capture the attention of certain types of young people, to shape their moral and intellectual outlook, and to redirect their attention to other higher matters. Socrates makes a brief appearance, for example, in the Hellenica. Very, very brief. So there's this work of history, uh, and I think that a number of us would turn there uh, for historical facts. Xenophon does, in fact, give us sort of history of the conclusion of the war, but I think there's a lot more going on. There are a number of problems, a number of historical problems with the book. I'm just going to mention just a few. I'm only going to mention two, actually, just for what it's worth. First, gentlemen and gangsters. Uh, this book, Hellenica, about the, Pel the end of the Peloponnesian War, Xenophon indicates that it's a book about what good men do. But there's a problem. Anyone who's ever studied history, we all know well that it's not just good guys, right? There are gangsters as well. So Xenophon explicitly calls any discussions of gangster types digressions from the main part of the book. So he's like, good guy, good guy, good guy. Let me take a moment, have a digression to talk about the tyrants, so and so. Yes. So he comes, he keeps going back and having digression. There's another thing that Xenophon does that's very curious in the Hellenic, and I, I hate to bore you, but it's uh, it's actually it's it's a boring book. It's real, like I, I I think that's wrong ultimately, but it, it presents itself as being very boring. Nearly every sentence begins with and, and then, and then, and then. And I was translating it to my, for myself recently, and, and like I sent it to a friend. He's like, "This is awful." And I said, "Yeah, it's, it, I'm sorry, but that's because the Greek is pretty terrible." Uh, but what I mean, I think that's meant to leave you an impression that history is kind of just an endless strings of thereafters, thereupon, in contradistinction to Thucydides, for whom history has this very clear order. I'm probably getting this wrong, but there's this big clear order, and there's it's understandable to the human mind. Xenophon seems to indicate just one thing after another. Okay. Uh, even, I'll give you the final words. So the book begins with the following uh, the, the book begins with the following words. And after that, that's the opening words to the book. Here are the last words. Uh, maybe someone will be interested in whatever comes next, and whoever wants to can write what happened after that. Like the book, it's just like it doesn't make any sense. So if you're interested in Xenophon, I just made a huge plug for the Hellenica. Buy my translation; it'll be coming out shortly. Uh, if you're interested in Xenophon, these are actually his more interesting books. Uh, at least they're they're great books to teach. Students love them. Uh, the Anabasis, as I mentioned, the rise or the ascent of Cyrus the Younger. Xenophon is the hero of this book, and the education of Cyrus, which some of you have read. These are books that I've taught with success every time I've taught it. Students love these books, especially The Education of Cyrus. It's an adventure story. Um, Xenophon, as I mentioned, is the hero, in fact, of the second book. Maybe if you guys don't know your ancient history, The Sea, The Sea, yes. This is the, the climax of the book when Xenophon has sex successfully uh, helped his army retreat to safety. It's not quite right, but that's kind of the climax. So he's, I'm going to skip this. We can talk about the analysis if you like just a little bit later. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on The Education of Cyrus. This, I believe, is Xenophon's masterpiece. If you haven't read it, I cannot encourage you strongly enough. It's a fantastic adventure story. Uh, my college students love it. Consider teaching it. Even if you have no expertise whatsoever in Greek history, it doesn't matter. The book comes alive for you. I literally just read it aloud with my students. The book practically teaches itself. All great books do. The book has a clear hero. S students, in my uh, experience, like heroes. Cyrus. Students pay closer attention when there's a hero to follow throughout the story, as opposed to a rotating cast of characters like, say, the Hellenica. Good stories make for good history. That's at least what I think. So as you, as you go through the education of Cyrus, the very beginning, those of you who read it, uh, Xenophon himself says there's a problem. When we look around the world, all we see is instability. Uh, democracies are overturned, monarchies are overturned, ty tyrannies are short-lived. The history of the world just seems to be perpetual turnover. There's no stability. And so Xenophon says, therefore, we drew the conclusion, who we is is not clear to me, we drew the conclusion that history is nothing but an endless series of nothings and that there's no answer to the problem of politics. And that's what he says. But then he says, there was this guy Cyrus. He figured it out. But we reflected on Cyrus, a Persian, and we were compelled to change our mind. Cyrus is a hero, and he's presented in the book as having solved the problem of politics. According to Xenophon, he solved it insofar as he possessed the knowledge or the science of politics. You've all probably heard of Cyrus the Great. We know about him from uh, Xenophon. We also know about him from Herodotus. We also know him from another book, the Bible. Uh, Cyrus is mentioned in Isaiah and Ezra, but also in Daniel and Nehemiah. And there are just some huge distinctions between Xenophon's account of Cyrus and 
in the account in Herodotus in the Bible for what it's worth. Um, if you were to compare Herodotus' account of Cyrus with Xenophon's, you'd see enormous departures regarding his birth, for example, his virtues and vices, his reign, and of course his death. They die differently in each book. This is a bad his historian who can't even get the death right. By contrast, in Xenophon, Cyrus possesses many of the moral virtues. He has self-control, he's industrious, he's willing to take risks, uh, he appears to be pious, and ostensibly all of this can be traced back to his Persian education, which aims to promote certain virtues and the common good of the Persian Republic. Uh, Persia is called a republic. Principally, they learn justice, moderation, obedience, continence, or self-control, in addition to some martial skills. And the goal seems to be to teach the boys to practice virtue for its own sake. Throughout the book, Cyrus appears to be just insofar as he treats the members of his military with respect. He removes class distinctions. He introduces a system of reward based on merit. He's clever. He's good with military strategy and tactics. He's innovative. He benefits almost everyone he comes into contact with, with the exception of maybe one person. He seems to have the names of every member of his army memorized, which is very impressive if anyone's ever taught a class. And he's eager to reward any noble deed that he witnesses. Here is how Cyrus is described by the barbarians, to tie this into what uh, Matthew was talking about just a moment ago. Uh, he's described as being beautiful in form. And then it says, in your translation, it probably says he's philanthropic, he loves learning, and he's ambitious. All, all three of those words have a P-H-I-L beginning in Greek, phil, love. So I would translate those to sort of show you the parallelism. He loves humanity, he loves learning, and he loves honor. This is how he's described by the barbarians. Now, those of you who have read The Education of Cyrus uh, know that Cyrus gets this Persian education, but then he sort of has, he has an interruption when he's still a boy, just an a young adolescent. He's called to his grandfather's house in Medea. I call this, when I teach this chapter, I call this chapter Cyrus's Semester Abroad or Cyrus's Multicultural Education. He now has two different regimes that he can compare things for, and this is, it has some interesting consequences for what's going on. I'll just point out two main things that he learns uh, while there. So if you remember in Persia, he's supposed to learn about justice and moderation and so on. When he gets to Medea, the very first story that's recounted is uh, there's a beauty contest. This is very, this Kalon Kalos word is mentioned again. And there's, this is in chapter three, there are three different beauty contests. Uh, little boy Cyrus runs up and he sees his grandfather who's dressed in rouge and makeup and a robe and platform shoes. And he says, Grandpa, you're so beautiful. And the mom who's there says, little Cyrus, uh, who's more beautiful, your, your grandfather or your Persian father? And Cyrus goes, oh, um, of the Persians, my father is the most beautiful. And of the Medes, it's grandpa. Problem solved, right? It's a very political answer. But it, what I would say is it also shows that he doesn't quite address this question of nobility or beauty. Which one actually is more noble? His father with the sort of Persian austerity or his grandfather with adornments, shall we say? There are two other um, beauty contests in this chapter. The, sec the third one, I'll go to the third one and then come back to the second one. So the first one is over who looks better, Persians or Medes, and he sort of says it's a tie. The third one is over food, which food is more beautiful, the Persian food or the Median food. And Cyrus says, actually, the Persian food, he prefers the simple fare rather than the fancy fare. But there's a second beauty contest where the Persians don't even have a competition. There's no competition. Robes and horses. Cyrus loves the beautiful robes and the beautiful horses in Medea. And there's no analog in Persia for him to even compare about. So the Ambler translation is really good, but insofar as it doesn't point out that these, it uses beautiful in the first instance, and then noble, and then fine. So it obscures the fact that there are these three things being stacked upon one another, asking to be uh, sort of compared. So my, I wanna, what I want to step back and say, therefore, Cyrus, there are these three beauty contests, and Cyrus didn't get to think through the question of the noble. The other important story while he's in Medea is that he's, his mom wants him to go home to Persia and he wants to stay in Medea. He really likes it there. He gets to hunt and ride horses. It sounds awesome. Um, and his mom says, well, how will you learn Persian justice if you stay here in Medea? She's worried that he'll get foppish like her, like her father, in fact. She calls him a tyrant. And he says, mom, I already know Persian justice. Let's just do what the law says. And, you know, the, it's two sentences. You don't need time to learn that. Do what the law says. And, he's, and then he says, look, one time when I was a kid, they made me judge of this dispute. A big boy, you guys, Tommy boy, big guy, little coat, remember this? There's a big guy with a little coat and a little guy with a big coat, and Cyrus was the judge, and he's like, switch him. You know, that's more appropriate. That's more fitting, right? And then he was beaten by an adult who said, the law says the big kid gets the little coat because it was his coat, and the little kid gets the big coat. So the, the law says, end of story. So in the beauty contests, we see that Cyrus didn't think these things through. 
And in the case of uh, justice, again, Cyrus sort of was thinking through this problem, what's appropriate, what's fitting, what's just. But he's be literally beaten from thinking it through. So I think that's a big problem. Um, the last thing I want to touch on sort of substantively before I sort of move to the end is uh, in the book that we just read, Cyrus gives a public speech. And in that speech, um, he's just been put in charge. Of, so he's grown up now a little bit. And he's been put in charge of the army. And uh, the, Mede the Medeans, his uncle's land, now his uncle's land, his grandfather's passed on, is being attacked by the Assyrians. And Cyrus has been put in charge of the army to defend them against the Assyrians. And when he stands up, he gives a speech. This is his first public act, as far as we can tell, in the education of Cyrus. And he begins by praying, and then he says the following. He says, our forefathers have been practicing virtue their whole lives, and I can't tell that they got anything out of it. He says, look, who in, the, who in their right mind would farm and then just not reap the harvest? Who would train for the Olympics for years upon years and then decide not to compete? He says, virtue has to pay. And so let's go out there and let's get some stuff. And so I guess what I, would, what I want you to take away from that is here in his very first public speech, Cyrus radically reorients the Persian understanding of virtue. Under the Persian Republic, virtue is practiced for its own sake. There's an external threat. Cyrus comes in and unleashes the appetitiveness of the army. And he says, now let's go fight. And the army is extremely successful. Fight after fight after fight, it's just completely successful. And at the very end, when they conquer Babylon and Cyrus comes back and says, all right, we've conquered everything. And the army's like, great, give us, virtue's got to pay. Cyrus is like, now you've got to really be virtuous. And they're like, what? We want all this. He's, by the way, Cyrus is now wearing rouge and makeup and stiletto hills. And he's like, no, 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 we must still be austere. And the army's like, we don't know what you're talking about. And so this speech is really important insofar as it, as it really undermines the attachment to virtue that, they, that was under the previous uh, regime. Cyrus basically uh, now has set himself up to be emperor, for what it's worth. Um, why do I like this book so much, then? This is very strange. Here's why I like teaching it, and it's a lot of fun. This is sort of, uh, you guys, if you guys watch the Star Wars stuff, they did this really bad. Like, like, they tried to show like a good young boy turning into a terrible, evil human being. The education of Cyrus does this perfectly. Like, students love Cyrus. They think he's amazing, he's impressive, he's noble, he's charming. And then they get to the end, and he's this tyrant. And they're like, what happened? I loved him. And so then I would then you know I say well now we got to go back and look look at his first speech, how even in his first public speech he's undermining his attachment to virtue. Look how way back when he was a kid he loved makeup and these kinds of things. And so I guess um, I guess Xenophon sort of has been suppressing the nasty stuff. Remember what I said earlier about leaving the um, the nasty stuff out. He's done that. Uh, the last thing I'll point out um, here is Cyrus's death. Does anybody know how Cyrus dies in Herodotus? Yeah. Yeah. He kills somebody in battle, and that guy's mom gets really mad. And she cuts his head off, and this is it right here, by the way. And she's got holding his head, and she's like, have your fill of blood now. And he puts it in a bucket of blood. In Xenophon, Cyrus dies peacefully in his sleep, surrounded by friends and family. I'm like, what's going on? So my point is that Xenophon, so he's completely leaving out this nasty part, right? But he, so he's wanting you to go back through and think through what's going on. And if you go back and think it through, you'll sort of see all the problems, I think. Um, let me just point out some of the teachings. I realize I'm running a little short on time. First, the political teaching. Republics are fragile. Attachment to Republican virtue is fragile. All it takes is an impressive person to sort of detach that or to reorient it even, not even to get rid of our concern for virtue. Cyrus is born into a republic. His peers are called citizens. By the end, they're called subjects, and he's called emperor. Let me remind you of the title of this book, The Education of Cyrus. Why did Xenophon call this book The Education of Cyrus? I believe that Xenophon called this book The Education of Cyrus in order to show us the limitations of Cyrus's education. He didn't understand things. I gave you two examples. I could give you a whole bunch more of instances where Cyrus encounters somebody, and there's an attempt at education, and he sort of flees. There's one on love. There's one on the gods. I mentioned the justice and the noble one. He just doesn't do these things. Uh, I'm going to read a quote for you from Cyrus at the end of the book. Cyrus says the following. He who is able to acquire the most while keeping to what is just and to what is most, uh, and to use the most while keeping to the noble, him I believe to be happiest. So just, noble, happy. 
Those are three things I, I, I put for your consideration that he hasn't actually thought through in his life. Uh, in contrast, by the way, since I'm, I, I'm, I'll just mention that Xenophon mentions that his own teacher, Socrates, was blessedly happy. So Xenophon's giving you this idea of, of Cyrus. I think he's trying to lead you to see that it was a failure, and then he's trying to get you to think through how was he a failure and why was he a failure, and the answer ultimately is education. He had a failed education. So then, if you're still interested, you'd say, well, what's a good education look like? And he lays that out for you in his Socratic writings, among other places. Uh, last, last point here, I'll just read a, a quote. This is in his book called The One Skilled at Hunting with Dogs. Rush right out and buy it right now. I know you're really excited. Uh, but it's, here he is, Xenophon, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. And in his little treatise on how to hunt, he tucks away in the, in the very last chapter, by the way, my books are written for all time. Right? And my, so you're like, hunting with dogs, what? I want people to become wise and good by reading my books, and I want my books to remain unrefuted forever. So I realize I did that a little quickly and a little grossly, but I tried to give you some idea of what's going on in Xenophon. Thank you very much. This should be good, and I really appreciate these talks so far. I appreciate Matt's framing um, with his lead questions, and um, I'd say two of those apply most to what I've got here. Number one, um, actually, I am interested in the liberal arts. Number two, what is history? Um, so I'd like to consider two Roman authors. Why do one when you can do two? I originally had three. I've actually cut one back. Um, but these are Seneca the Younger and St. Augustine, both of whom you'll know. Today, as I said, I'm going to approach both in terms of the history of the liberal arts because, A, the discipline of history um, is an offspring of those arts put it more provocatively, and as has already been hinted about, especially in Matt's paper, not necessarily any such thing as history per se in this time. We can come back to that. And B, whatever the authors do say specifically about Historia tends to be um, couched in conversations more broadly about the liberal arts and learning. I've taken then a somewhat literal approach on that very first question, what is history? And uh, it's, it ends up with um, forcing, forcing us to look at it through a taxonomy of histories. That's sort of what the slide is hinting at. Uh, you'll know some of these references. Uh, the second inquiry in investigation is the Locus Classicus for history coming from Herodotus. But actually, there's one behind that, come to find out. Uh, it's a noun. It's also a verb. Um, it's histor not only historia, and it's also historine. I just mentioned this to, to give a hint of the complications um, that we run into if we're thinking about the history of history. Um, my point is not to give a taxonomy here. Um, the point is to say the history of history, like the history of the arts, is complicated. Um, the liberal arts, for example, not a simple sequence. Uh, we know the basics, there came to be seven. That actually wasn't until the 6th century, probably, uh, even into the 7th century in some cases. We know they were adopted by the Romans um, from the Greeks. They're calling them artes liberales, which is a, a Latin phrase that does, in fact, appear most famously in Cicero. An older scholar said Cicero uses it. That should be enough. So we can talk about the liberal arts that way. Um, but the the... The list, there was no such thing as a canon. That list changed over time. It could even vary, not only among different authors, but even in an author. So you take a Roman imperial author like, uh, or during the Roman Empire, uh, an author like the great Philo, um, he ha his lists vary anywhere from three arts to six at various times. So it's all very unsettled. I used the word complex earlier. It's quite unsettled, but that makes it so interesting to me. So to start briefly, with Seneca, another basic thing that the three of us do and that you all do in the classroom, obviously, with history in particular, is to contextualize. Um, I had heard of the one letter I'm going to cite here, it just called uncreatively number 88, of his moral epistles. But number 88 I'd read, but I made it through um, graduate school without w really hearing it contextualized. So that's to... Um, encourage that sort of reading. Um, it answered, I, I, I understood the basics of the letter, but one of the things that comes across in this letter is that Seneca is grumpy. Uh, 
Somebody said uh, uh, earlier that, you know, when you start to think, when you have high hopes for virtue in your society, you tend to end up disappointed, and that's where Seneca is. But I would honestly, I'd read quite a bit about Seneca, a, a little about Nero, and I'd never really heard about connecting the dots. Well, why is he so angry? Why is he so uh, darn near despondent? And I think you can make a case, I'm not gonna build the entire thing here, but I think it just comes down to his biography. Here's a few notes. He's Spanish, his father was famous, both his brothers were more or less famous, one of whom appears in the book of Acts in the New Testament as a governor in the East. He's a Stoic philosopher, most people understand that about Seneca. Um, a relative late comer to come to the Roman elite that is in the city of Rome itself. Um, but when he does, he starts to move up the ladder really quickly. But by 49, he's been expelled from Rome, suspected of adultery with the sister of the Emperor Claudius. The good news is that he's brought back in AD 49 because of the good graces of a woman called Agrippina, which is also the bad news because she's going to give him his next job, which is to tutor her son, the young Emperor Nero. He was still a teenager when he came to power and he remained under Seneca's tutelage for some time. Judging by one of Seneca's early works, basically a, uh, a present for the new, the new emperor is called On Mercy or De Clementia. And he, he clearly from that work had high hopes for the young ruler um, as many Romans seem to, even among the traditionally skeptical senatorial class. Seneca described, uh, prescribes excuse me, mercy or clemency as the most important virtue for a ruler. But De Clementia was composed within two to three months of the first murder inside Nero's palace. His stepbrother was killed at age 13, mysterious circumstances. In 54, some four years later, Nero had commissioned the murder of his mother by a boating accident. Seneca was in self-imposed exile for the last few years of his life, unable, sort of trapped, unable morally to work for his boss. But his boss had, so to speak, made him an offer he couldn't refuse. He was frozen. He couldn't officially retire. He couldn't move without, uh, uh, say, a day's journey from Rome. He also couldn't end his life. Of course, Stoicism allowed for uh, some concept of a noble suicide. He couldn't do that for his family's sake. So it was really only in 65, finally, when he's, sorry, 68, 65, that is, sorry, when he's basically given the green light that he can take himself out, he does so. So what you're seeing in the letters is, to some extent, a, a leadership crisis, and it brings up the question about where virtue fits in leadership and where our expectations should be uh, where virtue is concerned for leadership. Has anybody seen hints of that topic on social media lately? So the disappointment is there. Let's look at the very beginning of this letter quickly. <clears throat> Liberal studies are the first two words of the epistle, and within the first few lines, they also hint at the author's wider disposition towards education in general. You could go so far as enti to entitle this letter Seneca against the liberal arts because they're just not enough. He says, I don't respect any study or count it among good activities if it results in a profit. These crafts, useful if they prepare the mind and do not distract it, one should linger in these as long as the mind cannot do anything greater. There are elementary training, but not our real work. You see why they're called liberal, because they're worthy of free man. But only one study is truly liberal, one that makes him free, sapientia, wisdom, a.k.a. philosophy. The rest of the arts are puny, puerile. Do you think there's anything good in these arts which teachers you seem to be the most which seem to be the most shameful and scandalous of all men. We ought not to learn these things, but to have learned them. There are some who've judged whether we sh that we should ask whether liberal arts make a, good, a man good, excuse me. But these other teachers don't even pretend that. 
Finally, grammar, he says, is preoccupied with care for speech. And if it wants to spread further about histories and to extend the boundaries to the limit, to poetry. Which of these lays a path toward virtue? So there you've got that Aristotelian relationship between uh, poetry and history. There's quite a bit happening in this first uh, passage. I, I, that's probably more distracting than not, but there's the whole thing in case you wanted it. I know that's too much text. Uh, a, it's certainly a high view of liberal learning to some extent in the sense that the liberal arts here are fit for a free man. This is, uh, in modern terms, the university as a place where nothing useful is taught. It's elite, not to say snobbish. But it's also a pretty good snapshot of where things stand educationally in circa, sorry, uh, 60 CE or so. We've got grammar, music, geometry, astronomy, and then he excludes, he makes a point of excluding later in the letter, painting, statuary, or making statues, that is, and athletics. I'll come back to this in a second. The second, a second interesting thing is that he's participating in teacher bashing, availing himself to a time-honored tradition that Thucydides, Thucydides Xenophon, everyone would have understood, um, no, bat, no doubt familiar to Plato as well. C, it's ambiguous because it's an insider's critique of this learning. This is a, a man who's had this education, criticizing that education, but ambiguous slash ironic because he's assuming that education is still going to continue after his time has passed. But to return to the outline here, obviously it's interesting to me that Historia is a species of the grammar genus, so to speak. Uh, another book I've run into uh, really in preparation for this talk that uh, y another thing I missed during graduate school was Gerald Press's book, The Development of the Idea of History and Antiquity, is amazing, pretty brief, uh, a bit dense, but, but really amazing. He doesn't talk about uh, Seneca th in this letter, but he does bring up the, a grammarian Dionysius Thrax, an Alexandria, uh, Alexandrian who flourished in the second century B.C., who also links history to something like uh, grammar. These are, this is the sixfold appearance of grammar as defined by Dionysius. Turns out Dionysius, it's a, it's a short handbook on grammar and it was widely popular from the Hellenistic period well into the imperial period, kind of a standard work. You can see prosody, exegesis, glossi, etymology, analogies, and the highest art criticism of poetic productions, again, that relationship. But he likens in the original this gloss or glosses to historia. It's basically a, a synonym there, which is interesting. That's picked up, I'm arguing, not necessarily directly from Dionysus in Seneca's later letter about the same, a similar um, topic. So here we've got a gloss of unfamiliar person, places, or events. We've also got an entry of something like a subject of history into Western civilization, not as a discipline, but as information about various matters in whatever literature one studied. This is obviously not our history. In fact, searching for history in Seneca can be frustrating for anyone hoping for a familiar, less than uh, ill-defined definition. In fact, no field yet existed. There's nevertheless reason to bear our history in mind while reading ancient authors if no historical discipline is delineated by Seneca or Augustine, as we'll see in a second. Some things that will become distinctive characteristics of it are certainly present. Let me give you a few examples from the letter. Consider the questions that are asked by Seneca. These are all, uh, by the way, not worth of the philosopher's time, he's saying, but that doesn't matter to my argument. Things like, who, who is older, Homer or Hesiod? What's the route of Ulysses' wandering, Odysseus' wanderings? Would you have me unroll the annal of the world's histories and try to find out who first wrote poetry? 
Or shall I make an estimate of the year, number of years which lie between Orpheus and Homer? This is, I think, by our account, history. Each one of those things. So, but, but he's not, obviously, using that word. <clears throat> and, in fact, he's also uh, pretty cynical about them. Again, that's a separate argument. In another letter, finally, one of his theses is that each man can collect from the same source uh, and see different things. He pictures two individuals reading the same text, Cicero's uh, De Republica. The one is a philologist, that's the Latin in, in uh, Seneca, and the other is a grammaticus given to philosophy, so it's kind of a sophisticated teacher. The philosopher, or this grammaticus, wonders that so much could have been said against justice. The philologist, on the other hand, takes up the same book and comments as follows, and I'll run through this quickly, but it proves the same point. There were two Roman kings, one with a fa without a father and one without a mother. We can't settle who Servius's mother was. The philologist also notes that the officer whom we call dictator and about whom we read in our histories under that title was named in old times the Magister Populi. Such is the name existing today in the augural records. He will remark too that Romulus met his end during an eclipse, that there was an appeal to the people even from the kings, etc., etc. history by 21st century standards. He continues, when the grammaticus unrolls the same volume, he puts down his notebook in the, form, in the forms of words, making what we would call etymological or philological notes. So again, we're back to these complications. Here, his grammaticus has turned into our philologist. It's really frustrating to read. It's a headache. But it illustrates that fluid, unsettled state of categories where history among any given dev, uh, um, discipline is. It's also an advertisement for learning Latin because even in going back over these letters, the, the translations differ. And if you're thinking about subject in particular, for example, the more recent uh, translation mentions the subject of history. But in the Latin, it's simply ea, the, st the thing that's called history, which is arguably not the subject, right? For a minute, I thought my, my argument here that there's no such thing as history was uh, undermined, but the Latin says no such thing. To move briefly to Augustine, uh, two stepping spots for him. Um, the most significant work of historiography from his corpus is, of course, um, the city of God. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk instead about... Uh, Two snippets, one from De Ordine, or On Order, a book he wrote shortly after converting, pre-baptism, uh, in something like 386. Uh, and two, his De Doctrina Christiana, which, like the grammar I mentioned earlier, was hugely uh, popular into the medieval period. So halfway through De Ordine, first of all, he too, like Seneca in his letter, Augustine gives a nice little chapter and picture, a snapshot, I guess, of the lay of the land. He includes grammar, dialectic, rhetoric, music, and geometry. Um, there is a sixth, um, which he calls astrology in the Latin, which of course subsumes our astronomy as well. He'll make the distinction between those two pretty uh, forcefully in De Doctrina Christiana 10 years later. Uh, all these things can be good, Augustine says, but one of the things he's wrestling with over the course of his long career is the relationship a convert should have to all of this learning, and I'm not going to go into that in detail. I'm sh I assume both his biography and his approach to that question are fairly familiar to you. But I will say that about 10 years later, we've got De Doctrina Christiana, which is something like a manual. There's a lot has been written about how exactly to think about this work. I've heard it, it's, it reads like uh, something like what we'd find in a seminary today or in a divinity school. Um, but uh, uh, there's scholars out there who said he actually has students, even adolescents, in mind that 
we won't we don't need to go into that but the audience is a question the point was there is always a large audience but this too has some really significant thinking about learning but also history in particular he doesn't list disciplines in de doctrina christiana and his his argument is actually a little bit hard to harder to follow arguably than it had been in uh, de ordine but he does have sections on grammar history rhetoric and quote number he also includes uh, knowledge that falls under our natural science, plants, rocks, animals, astronomy, zoology, etc. But by the middle of the second of the four books, it's pretty clear that Augustine is taking some positive stance or open stance towards pagan learning, despite his recent conversion. It would be foolish, he says, for the Christian to reject the alphabet because of its ancient associations with Mercury, nor should justice or virtue be spurned because pagans had dedicated temples to each of them. A person who's a good and true Christian should realize that truth belongs to his Lord wherever it is found, gathering and acknowledging it even in pagan literature. This culminates in his famous it spoils of the Egyptians motif. He didn't invent, but he breathed life into it in that work. Okay, to finish up, on the, the short section on history in Augustine, he says, anything then that we learn from history about the chronology of the past, sorry, I can't work this wheel. Uh, <clears throat> is very useful for the interpretation of scripture. To make a long story short, with Augustine in this work in particular, as in Seneca's letter, history was a species of grammar. In Augustine, it's a species of rhetoric. As you will know if you've read, especially uh, The City of God, but several of his work. It's apology, apologetics. It's exegesis. It's a defense of his faith. It's a, a a bank, it's been called, or a reservoir of proofs for the truths of Christianity, which is arguably a new use if you add the religious aspect into it. Ultimately, what we're seeing, though, is enough uses of history historically and in the ancient period, enough different meanings for it, that we can all fit in there somewhere, and we can end the pernicious myth that's called, I'm just not a history person. Thank you. Thank you.